what's up everybody you're here to watch the interview with will and we're going to get to that in a second but first i wanted to let you know that in the beginning of this interview i screw up in a visual sense so it's not going to impact the actual audio file that we're going to put on spotify and apple uh, podcasts and stuff so i wanted to make this little clip ahead of the youtube version to let you know that i screwed up and it was like immediately in the interview and so i'm just gonna let you see me screw up and enjoy it cringe with me while you also admire how much will crushes it in this interview so i won't keep you anymore please enjoy and record all right we're recording so i'm gonna go ahead and uh read my little intro all right hey everybody welcome to information requested the podcast where we talk about books, progression, fantasy, and whatever we feel like. Today, I have the man, the myth, and the legendary scriber of medium-sized tomes, <laughs> Sir William White. He's written the Traveler's Gate series, the Elder Empire series, and a little-known series called Cradle. Some say Will resides in a moving castle, somewhere in the midst of the Bermuda Triangle, while others... <laughs> claim he resides in a dark tower hidden in the death marshes of the Florida Everglades. It took three months to finish the gnomish summoning ritual, but at long last, the hidden gnome king has seen the bat signal and has answered the call. <laughs> Welcome to Information Requested, Will. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Welcome back from vacation. Yeah, thank you. What's it, uh, yeah. what's it been like coming back? We'll talk about the vacation. Coming back, well. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny because coming back has been, it's been both more and less intense than I expected it to be. Uh, more in the sense that there was a lot to catch up on that was different than I expected. So it was, there was just a lot of people I had kind of not caught up with in the last few months that I'm now trying to slowly catch up with. Okay. And then less in the terms of uh, the team is handling a lot more than they were before. So I come back and I sort of on some level expect to have to deal with a lot of certain tasks that are now dealt with. And now we have people to handle those things. So basically I can sort of focus on writing, which is a weird feeling. Back to basics. Yeah. In, 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 the, in the OG days, like the Traveler's Gate days, you didn't mm -hmm. have all that extra stuff to worry about, right? Uh, yes and no. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, I didn't have as much as many fans. I didn't have as many platforms. I didn't have people interviewing me on their podcast, for instance. But in the Traveler's Gate days, I also had to kind of do most of the stuff myself. So I had to format and upload the books myself. I had to, any fan interaction had to be done by myself, any sort of tech support or whatever. Well, I better figure that out. So while I still had help, I, there was a lot more I had to deal with other than just writing by myself. That's now covered. So delegation is always one of the hardest things to like, yeah, like yeah. be able to like, let go of, like for me, I try to delegate sometimes and then I still am like fighting this urge to micromanage. And yeah. so it's interesting to me that you, you like truly went on vacation in like mm -hmm. the actual original sense of the word and disconnected and then yeah. things just manage themselves and it sounds like in a good way yeah well that's cool congratulations well one of the reason is that it's taken us so long for me to get such a long break is because it took us a while to build the infrastructure necessary that it could keep running while i was gone okay so that was uh that just it took a while it takes time yeah. so then it was i was able to just let it go and they can handle stuff when i am gone Okay. So it was, it was cool. It was exciting. I had a good time. Yeah. So, okay. I have a question then about not necessarily the building of the infrastructure, but the prioritization of building the infrastructure. Like at what point okay. did that become a priority? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, from the beginning, I had always prioritized getting other people on board and helping because in order to do all this stuff as a self-published author, you have to really fill a lot of roles. You got to wear a lot of hats and you can't be good at everything. So I really needed help, especially if I wanted to expand and, and go to that next level. 
there are a lot of authors who do a really great job and write great stories, but their expansion is often limited by that's what they do. That's what they're good at. And that's, that's what they do. And they don't bring other people on because that takes a lot of time and effort to do itself that they don't want to spend away from writing, which is fully understandable. That's absolutely what I'd be doing if I didn't have help is I would just be writing books and then I would be handling the stuff myself. And I, I just think it's very important to get other people involved and, and helping and just cause you can't, can't do everything yourself. And so if you're really trying to do more than just release a couple of books a year, then you've got, you've definitely got to have people on. So that was always a priority of mine, but as it, as we grew and kept developing and getting more fans, it became more and more urgent that I not be handling everything myself because we would have, we would have plateaued at a certain level because there's only so much I can handle. Okay. Yeah. So the, on Reddit, I saw that you told, like you, you were very open and vulnerable in sharing that the last, I guess, technically the last four books you've written. So mm -hmm. Winter Steel, the last two of Kings and Killers of Killers and Kings, and then Uncrowned. You didn't really mm -hmm. like writing them. I did not. And so was that a, it sounds like it was a combination of things, but mm -hmm. let's put the like existential weight of having not finished OCAC on, on the side for a second and talk about like, was the, the lack of infrastructure, the, the knowledge that in your head you couldn't actually step away if you wanted to, a contributor? Like, what, what, what helped contribute to the, the not enjoying of it? So first of all, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because that was a comment I made, a reply to a comment on Reddit. And I didn't expect it to blow up the way it did, but apparently people found me. Uh, so... <clears throat> So I don't know that the knowledge that I couldn't get away was a contributing factor. I definitely think Kings and Killers hanging over my head for so long was absolutely a contributing factor to stress and burnout and building up. over this. Because every single time I felt pressure to get the next Cradle book out, but that pressure was compounded because I also felt the pressure to get Kings and Killers out. So it just was kind of an extra layer. But uh, Kings and Killers, let me back up for a second. There's this idea that some people have that you can tell from the quality of a book whether the author is having a good time writing it or not. And in my experience, you cannot. No. It is not at all linked. So you can still do a good job and not be enjoying the process because the response to Kings and Killers was really good. I enjoyed it. I think it came out well. I, I enjoyed the final product. I think it came out well. But writing it was absolutely miserable. I hated it from beginning to end. It was terrible. Uh, I have nothing good to say about the process of writing Kings and Killers. <laughs> it was it was very bad. Okay. Uh, well, I, so, I agree with you. I, I think it was great. It was my favorite. You agree with me that it was terrible. Okay, it was a terrible process. Well, I see. the All process right. sucked. I think, you know, waiting five years, whatever you did, is, is a contributing yeah, factor yeah. to that. But honestly, there's a silver lining. The books were yeah. better because of the weight. Yeah, I do think they were. I, I just, it was, it, it it was one of those things where I was like, I wasn't going to say this while I was working on them because I, I didn't want people to make up their minds ahead of time that these books were going to be bad. But then, yeah. But then when I released them and they had a positive response, I was going, okay, in a few months, I'm going to tell people that this process was just terrible. So I'm glad you lied. I'm glad you did like the, the final product. I really, I liked the way they, they came out. But it was that was the same. And then I know some people were like, ah, oh, he obviously didn't enjoy the process of writing Uncrowned. Okay, yeah, but I didn't enjoy the process of writing Winter Steel either. Right. So it was, there's not, a, there, there isn't this big divide where you can tell, ah, he was just rushing through this to get it done. Nope, I mean, not really. But I was rushing through Winter Steel to get it done. <laughs> I was well, I rushed through everything to get it done. Yeah, well, you, I mean, you rushed your bloodline too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Especially if you finished so, it before you left. I did. Yeah. It, uh, the funny thing is Bloodline is now, I think it's the third longest cradle book. So Winter Steel is head and shoulders bigger than everything else. But it is, I think, right under Black Flame. And it took me like 25% longer to write than Winter Steel, even though Winter Steel is 50% wow. longer. And a lot of that was just the amount of time it takes me to write isn't necessarily the content it's when I get lost. I kind of, I kind of get off in the weeds because I'm trying to, what I do in my head is I try to make the book better. 
And in order to do that, I sort of get lost. I, I start following whatever trail or I start going, oh, I need to think about this and replan and try to make it better. But that ends up a lot of times being wasted time. It doesn't really make the book better. What would what does is staying on track, trucking it out, getting content out, and then making it better on the backside. Not not trying to replan while I'm while I'm writing, but taking whatever I whatever content I produce and then making it better later. And that is just a hard lesson for me to internalize. So I end up Dude, kind of killing like time. A universally hard lesson to in- what? Wow. Okay, I'm speaking for everyone because I experience exactly what you're experiencing. Yeah. But you, the fact that you still experience it, having written so many books, but you still get the product done. So I mean, there's a a discipline there, but also, like, how how far in do you sometimes get to those weeds before you become self aware and check yourself? Like. <laughs> Uh, some of, so the, for this, in this particular case, I basically lost two weeks, uh, for uh, on bloodline. I say lost, I was working the whole time, but it was, I, what I was working on was wrong. Uh, I, I, so what I started to do was I started to, to go off and be like, uh, I need to replan this. Um, Lyndon's horrific death scene needs to be a lot more dramatic. Definitely more uh, dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it needed to really land. No, I, I I felt like I needed to rethink the basic plot. I felt like I was I was coming up with new ideas. I was trying to go. Well, this doesn't make a lot of sense. I got to make sure I really land this one because it's so important. And so I start thinking through things and I test out scenes. And I what I used to do this a lot was I would write scenes and then go nah and and pitch them. And that's why I have a lot of ex, extra content for like Black Flame, for instance, is because I would go in a certain direction and then not like it, and I would back up and then go somewhere else. So in this case, I spent two weeks doing that before I realized I, in this past two weeks, I've gotten less word count actually added to the manuscript than I had in the previous week. Uh, wow. So I was, I, and I was starting to panic because my deadline was coming up. So I had to really st- almost start over. I had, to, I had to build the momentum again in the right direction, which was gunning toward finishing the book. And I, I came to that realization on my own, but I always need the help of someone else to, to tell me that and to help me refocus. Even when it's somebody I know to do, it's one of those weird things. I'm working with a friend of mine who just finished his first book. And so I'm trying to, or trying to help him develop that. And he has, he's finally understood what I'm talking about when I say, look, you know what to do, but you need somebody to tell you that anyway. And it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel intuitively right. It feels like, well, I know what to do. I know what he's going to tell me. So I need, I need to just do it on my own. But it's still like, no, you need someone to tell you, get back to work, just start slamming keys. Yeah. And that's true across all, all categories of life. Like how many mm -hmm. of us know that eating pizza is not good for you and you should eat vegetables. Right. Right. right? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, Hey, eat some vegetables or hey maybe don't yeah. have pizza for the third time this week that's what oh, yeah. that's what megan says to me she holds me accountable <laughs> and i have found and it sounds like you have found this too i am much better when i'm holding myself accountable to someone else and they're holding me yes. accountable than when i hold myself accountable to myself yeah the accountability is huge people it's interesting because people i think people have a uh different view of self-discipline than I do because in my view it is if I want to control myself rather than working really hard to just muscle through it with willpower the the discipline comes in where I have created a situation where I have to do it so I I know that with that if I try to force myself to do it it might work but it's going to exhaust me and I'm going to run out of that really really quick so instead, I try to put myself in a scenario where I have no choice but to do what I know I need to do. So that's why I try to go out and be isolated when I'm writing, because now I have nothing to do but write. Uh, it's why I try to get people to stay on my back all the time and tell me what to do and tell me what I need to do and get me to crack the whip and get me to get me to move. Because it's like, oh, well, if you want to do that, why don't you make yourself do that? It's way better to get somebody else to make you do it. Yeah. So you're, you're like borrowing yeah. willpower from them. Absolutely. Sense. Yeah. And then. Yeah, and I found that, especially when it comes to flow state, right, it's very mm-hmm. hard to create a routine that will consistently get you into a flow state if yeah. you are bad at holding yourself accountable. But if you're good at working with other people to hold you accountable, 
I found that if that's in, in, introduced into a routine, you can then be like, okay, this person's counting on me. These people are counting on me. I found that I can get into flow state better. That helps a lot too. I also have found that what a lot of people don't realize is how much accountability is built into their jobs. So there's a lot of, or, or their school or their classes or whatever. A lot of people feel like, oh no, well, I, I did this and I, it was all internal. And you don't realize how many people you really are accountable to. You're accountable to your coworkers, you're accountable to the client or the person you're delivering it to, your teacher or whatever. And I have to, and a lot of other people in other arenas have to create that themselves. And I have found that that works a lot better for me. Some of the best businesses in the world have grown their business because they are going above and beyond to put the customer first. And that yeah. is building in that accountability. Like you, you, yeah, you, yeah. you're working for yourself. And this is actually an interesting concept that I, I, I throw around um, when I think about, you know, quitting the full time grind and working mm -hmm. for myself in whatever capacity yep. I'm thinking, okay, this is what everyone considers to be the dream. They mm -hmm. love the idea of making their own schedule. They love the yeah. idea of like sitting down for work whenever they want to or sleeping mm -hmm. in. But it's <laughs> like you've said, as soon as you enter that arena that the guardrails or the bumpers are pulled off or yeah. are, are, are dropped, you can roll gutter balls for two weeks in a row as you get lost in the weeds, right? You can, yeah. unless you already have a, an established discipline practice of like getting up and doing work every day at the same time, like, like you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And I do not, I'm not a structured person at all. So I, have, yeah, so I have to, uh, I really have to have people hold me to this kind of stuff. Well, good. Now you have a team. So that yeah. brings me to another point I wanted to bring up uh, that we talked about just before the podcast is I know of one blog post where you've shared a nonfiction self-help type situ like story. This is when you talked mm -hmm. about your uh, uh, your love of the blog Wait, Wait But Why by Tim Urban. And uh, yep. the article you brought up was the instant gratification monkey. I keep wanting to say the, procra the procrastination monkey. I know. I call it the procrastination monkey all the time, but it's not It's not what the, he actually uses. He calls it the instant gratification monkey. Yeah. So let, talk to me a little bit about how that article spoke to you and how like, we've already kind of covered it, so we don't have to talk about it too much, but I am interested in like one, your own experiences with the instant gratification monkey or the, or the procrastination monkey. And then two, your other interests in nonfiction. So like that's kind of like yeah, a, okay. a branch away thing. So let's talk about the procrastination yeah. monkey for a second. Uh, well, first of all, I really just enjoy the Wait But Why blog by Tim Urban. I think he puts a lot of thought and research into his posts, and that's probably why they only come out like twice a year. But his his posts often end up being like entire five part novellas. But I love the way he approaches the research and builds his case, and it just helps me think very thoroughly through problems. So I, I just want to plug that blog if anybody's out there and hasn't heard of it. Yeah, the link will uh, be in the YouTube description. Oh, great, perfect. So the analogy here, and I'm gonna probably butcher this because I haven't read the blog in a long time, and so if you want the accurate version, I will. Go to I will the work with you to to make it accurate. I haven't read it in a while perfect. either, but so the. The idea is he's illustrating the process of procrastination with the panic monster and the instant gratification monkey. So as you're trying to pilot the ship of your life, or you're trying to basically run yourself and you're trying to make your own decisions, you have this little monkey. And I actually, I, this, this blog meant so much to me that I bought his official instant gratification monkey stuffed animal. So I have it here. I keep it on my desk. I have a knockoff version. Yeah, that's, that's whatever. It's whatever reminds you of the instant gratification monkey. So the instant gratification monkey is on your back trying to get you to do things that are instant gratification. They're trying to get you to, to do the stuff you want to do now that would be fun. And the only thing that scares away the instant gratification monkey is the panic monster. So when you know that the essay is due tomorrow and you're going to fail the class if you don't write the essay, then you panic and then you don't have to deal with this guy anymore. You don't, need, you don't even have anybody in your head telling you go for the instant gratification stuff because you're panicked. So then you immediately hammer out the essay. You have no problems and you write it and you're like, cool, next time I'm just going to write this all ahead of time and I'm going to write it. But then when that happens, the panic monster is not around to help you deal with the instant gratification monkey. 
So I that blog came out in late 2013, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So I I read that after having oh, written. Right. Yeah, well, the only reason I remember that is because I uh, I had just written Crimson Vault. Okay. So I was I had written House of Blades and Crimson Vault, and I was working on City of Light. And I read that blog, which pre- previous to then I had seen a couple of the Wait But Why posts, but I hadn't, like I didn't follow the blog or anything. And I read that, and it just so clearly described the battle I had been fighting to write those two books, and then now working on, in this case, working on the third, that I, I, I cried. I absolutely teared up, and I ended up emailing Tim Urban about it, just going, look, this is who I am, this is what I do. And uh, it what you said described my internal battle so clearly. Because, excuse me, because in school, I had always just even in grad school writing, writing for that, I had always just gone, okay, whenever I panic, I'll write it. So then when I did panic, I wrote it and it was fine, but I didn't care about that. So then when I was trying to write something, I actually did care about a a novel that I really did want people to read. I kept trying all these different things to try and finish my work before the panic set in. And I j- felt like I couldn't do it. I felt like I was fighting a losing battle. I felt like I was talking to, talking just a few minutes ago about, about all the willpower it takes to push through. I felt like I was constantly fighting this really difficult battle and failing. And that helped me describe it so well that I said that. And then, of course, I bought the, bought the monkey, which I still have. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's, I guess that answers the question. Yeah. Well, not only that, I think it, if you're watching this, you're interested in writing, you're interested in becoming an author, or you're interesting and in, you're interested in finishing a passion project for yourself. Will is one of the most successful self-published authors most of us have ever heard of or ever seen in action. And to see that he has overcome this, still, it's it's a um, Will. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's still a constant battle, and it will absolutely. Continue. Like I said, I just got off track on Bloodline, the one I just wrote. <laughs> So exactly. that's my 18th book. Yeah, yeah. So the moral of this story is that you can mm-hmm. overcome it. These are these are constructs in your mind that uh, so many people deal with, especially in the modern age of uh, dopamine hits and distractions, um, yeah. especially with social media, with all the different things that connect us to the you know the wide world around us. Uh, focusing on something long enough to get into a flow state to finish it is probably one of the hardest things uh, in the world, especially when it comes to a book or software or a video game or whatever. Yeah. You were talking, you've been talking about the flow state and I, what I have talked to people about a lot is the way to get into the zone, which is usually how I say it, but the same thing. Uh, The way I get into the, the way to get into the zone is to work hard when you're not in the zone. So you've got to power through it when you're not in the zone to get into the zone. And I, the only reason I tell that people so often is because I need to hear it. So I need people around me to keep telling me that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's a lot easier to get started when you're already in the zone and you're feeling this great inspiration, but that so rarely happens. Yeah. The, when motivation strikes to me, that means, okay, I have enough fuel to start something, but if I don't dedicate enough of that fuel towards setting up a sustainable process or system Mm -hmm. or put in you know help in place once that fuel runs out it's over with because i don't have the routine or process in place to keep it going so um i'm gonna plug a book real quick atomic habits by james clear is one of my favorite nonfiction books because Mm -hmm. it talks about how to utilize your willpower when you have it to set up small habits that compound so that you're not constantly using up all your willpower to try and get things That's funny. done. I haven't, I haven't read that one. The ones that pop into my head are Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and uh, The Power of Habit, I think is mm-hmm. what that other one's called. Yeah, so uh, yeah. The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg is all the research, and it's really well written. This takes it a step further. Uh, okay. And it actually says that in one of the first chapters. It's like uh, uh, the if someone took all of Charles's research – applied it to the modern day and then broke it down a little bit further. That's what atomic habits is. And James clear is a really good writer. In fact, I think he's in the similar, like he's probably peers with Tim urban. 
Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Wow. It's 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 good. But the the main thing I'm thinking about right now from that is if you have the motivation, like I said, it's the fuel to get started. It's not the fuel that will take you through to finish. Yeah. You yeah. gotta gotta make atomic habits to do it or or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's cool. That's, that really that's funny because that really is exactly the principle I was talking about. As I was saying, instead of trying to muscle through everything by myself, what I prefer to do is muscle through setting up other people to get me to care to get me through the end. Because there's no way I could wake up every day and just power through. Okay, I'm definitely gonna hit ten thousand words today or whatever. It's I just would I, I fail too much. I, I just would I would you do that three days in a row and you run out. So rather than do that, it's establishing boundaries that are going to keep no matter how you that, that are going to keep you doing that no matter how you feel. Establishing and respecting boundaries, one of the most untalked about secrets to success, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So let's let's uh, not talk about what you did on your vacation because you've already talked about that. Okay. But I would like to know. It's early, but did the vac- mm-hmm. first question? Did the vacation accomplish what you wanted it to accomplish? Well, there were really two things I wanted it to accomplish. Uh, one of them was I was, <laughs> I was dead by the end of writing Budline. I was pretty dead by the end of writing Kings and Killers, but you know, I had books to write. So I was very dead by the end of writing Bloodline. And part of that was, I just wanted it to, I just wanted it to bring me back to life. Uh, I was a, a withered tree and I really wanted to, to be a green and healthy tree again. So that was one, one task. And then the other task was I wanted it to, I guess, rejuvenate me to move forward, encourage me to, to, to move. So I wanted it to bring me back to baseline. And then I would also like to, to go a little further than that, like, like fuel me up a little bit. So I know it did the first thing because basically for the first six weeks, I was sort of a, a, a dead man lying on a table and I slowly like a zombie came back to life. My next question is going to be about that. So yeah. Keep, oh, great. Yeah. Keep going. So that was, uh, that took me a long time, man. And it's funny because it was, it was, I could see it. I could, I really felt differently. I, I acted differently. People around me could tell. Uh, every week I was a little bit, I was clearly better than the last week. And it was interesting because I, I was just acting differently. I felt differently. I was on edge a lot less. So I just had a long way to go to get back to neutral. And that it's, it's you know, it's been, it's been a fantastic last eight years, but it's also, I've, I've, it's been a lot. So it was good to, good to dig out of that hole. And then the second part in terms of getting refocused, redirected, re-energized, I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know if that worked yet. You've been back like a week, right? Yeah, exactly. I haven't, I haven't done anything yet, so I, I'm not really sure. I think one of the things I need to do is see how I. Okay, I'm gonna go into this. It's gonna take a second, but I, I mentioned earlier that I had a team to handle a lot of things, right? Well, I haven't had. I mean, I've had people helping me, but I haven't had a team to deal with stuff like uploading books and uh, handling a lot of the uh, fan interactions just on the the normal level uh, and dealing with problems that arise, tech support, that kind of thing. I haven't had people to do that until recently. So now we have a system that's really, that's really helping me do this. But I learned what writing a book feels like having to do all that myself Mm -hmm. or the lion's share of it myself. So the emotions of what it takes, what I, when I imagine in my head, what writing a book takes, it comes with all of those emotions attached to it too. So it's not just writing a book. It's also doing all this extraneous stuff around writing a book that causes a lot of extra stress. Now that isn't the situation anymore, but I still feel like it is. So your brain hasn't experienced the process without it yet. And so it only knows that the the baggage on on the side that's absolutely right so we had we did have these people for winter seal and bloodline as well as well so i did have this experience except i was already so burnt out from those they felt like i felt like i was equally burdened so those aren't even good emotional they didn't help me feel better because those were very difficult so now i have this feeling in my head like oh man i gotta write a book however when i imagine You can write a book, but all you have to do is write the book. That feels like, oh, that feels amazing. And that is the actual situation I'm in. But when I project ahead and go, now I've got to write Cradle 10, I feel like, oh, 
man, it's going to take so much effort and time and it's going to be so emotionally draining. So I feel like it's going to put me right back where I was before, but it shouldn't. There's no reason it should. We've all solved all those problems. So it's, it's an interesting, I've got to train my, my brain to a, a action train. reward. Power of habit. Yes. Yeah, Q, exactly. Action reward. Yeah. So I've got to retrain my brain now as to what it takes to write a book. Cause it used to take me a lot more. Well, congratulations. You've leveled up to the point where now all you have to do <laughs> yeah. is write the book. Okay. So yeah. what, I, what I was going to uh, bring up before is the, the relationship between the amount of time between when you take a vacation and the amount of time required for you to decompress enough for you to actually get value from the vacation. So in like okay. the corporate world, I've noticed that the most anyone will take is a week because they have this existential dread that when they return, like if they take too long, people will not think that they're working hard or whatever. But what I notice is it takes the week before they're decompressed enough to actually enjoy the, the vacation yeah. and then they have to go back to work. And so yeah. what I was thinking about with you is that you've taken so long before you like you've taken an actual true break that it took you six weeks of decompressing before you were able to start the rest and relaxation part of like re-energizing yourself yeah so yeah that, uh, that so we we did a lot of research before doing a long break like this to go what does it really take to to do correctly the one thing we couldn't do because we had to finish bloodline was plan like we we needed we we should have done a more clearer plan of action at the beginning right before going into this break and we just didn't have time to so i needed to, i just needed to get on break so we just dove right into it but we the, all this research indicated that if you're doing this really long sabbatical process that's three months long they suggested three or four months and they suggested have the first month at least to be just recovery and I definitely found that to be true. So if I had been taking a normal break between books, I would have probably gone back to work after the first month, but I would have still needed a month off just to get back to neutral. So it's just, I was just so far in, in the negative that it, it took that, that long to, to get back. Wow. Well, I'm glad you got back. Yeah. I mean, at the, very, yeah, at the very least. So like, again, if you're watching this, and you're in the corporate world, or even if you're a student, vacations exist for a reason. Yeah. Like the humans aren't meant to work themselves 80 hours a week all the time. You will break down. It happens to everyone. Uh, I think the U.S. is probably one of the worst countries about it because I think Europe has like mandatory longer vacations. Yeah, I, I can't speak a whole lot to other cultures, but I do know that in our country, it's it's kind of your ex it's kind it's it's a sign of weakness it's a it's it's like a well if you're privileged enough to be able to do this good for you most people can't so exactly. it or it's like yes you uh you need to uh you don't you don't need to take a break you should be working as hard as you can to be productive and so this is like a yeah you don't really need a three-month break i didn't get a three-month break and there's there's this kind of attitude that it's sort of wrong and I go, look, there's most people can't afford to take a three month break. And I am, I very much understand that. Obviously I've been there most of my life until, well, until this year. Uh, so it's, I just, I wish people could. And one of the things I, I wish we would understand as a group is I, I think my opinion is it's necessary. It's more necessary than we realize breaks are more valuable than we realize. And perhaps you're more stressed and burdened than you realize. And we don't value that as much, I think. And so because I do have that opinion, and I wish everybody could do it. And now I'm in a position where I can, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, I was like, well, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and do it. But there really still was, even as much as I say all that, I really do believe I wish everybody could get one. I think they're, the long breaks are important and more important than we realize. But even said, having said that, I did feel kind of guilty because I'm going, yeah, I couldn't have done this a couple of years ago or really even last year. I couldn't I couldn't have even done it. And most people can't do it. And I wish they could. And I wish I could help them do it. But I felt guilty doing it because most people can't. 
So it's like, well, yeah, who am I to take a long break? Because I mean, even people in my family can't, I mean, most people I know can't afford to do that. Yeah. So it, it, I have a, I, I experience some of the same guilt that you feel sometimes. And I, I just have this, this like metaphor that I use is like, you have to fill up your own cup first and then fill mm-hmm. up everyone else's cups with the overflow of your cup. Yeah. And the metaphor here for those you know listening is that when you fill, filling up your cup is not money. It's not finances. It's, it's sleeping enough. It's eating right. It's maintaining your energy. It's making good decisions. And then there's also like the financial and like resources component. And uh, let's, uh, let's cheers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, I've just ran out of Coke zero and I'm using the knockoff brand. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called diet Coke. It's uh, it's not as good. I don't never heard of it. It's not as good. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. Like if you don't take care of yourself first, you won't be able to take care of anyone else. That's why on planes, they tell you to put the mask on yourself first. Cause if you run out of oxygen, everyone falls. So that's a great analogy. And the other thing is I said something negative a second ago about, our culture not valuing rest as much as I think it should. And I I stand by that. But the, one of the good things has been, we do now we're starting to value and the the term usually people use is self care, but we're starting to value that filling up your own uh, goblet. When, when you see people doing that, you're not usually critical. And I think it almost may be one of those things where you feel like if I, where I feel like if I do it, people are going to be critical of me. But when I see people doing it, I'm not critical. I'm like, good for you. I'm glad you can do that. Yeah. And so that's been, that was been positive. And that was definitely the overwhelming response when I said I was going to do it is everybody was like, Hey, good job. Take care of yourself. And I, I really appreciated all that support. So that was, that was great. I was I definitely think, expect, not expecting that response. I think it's a great example to set though. You know, it, I definitely agree that the culture in the U S has traditionally, especially from like 1950 onwards, it was very like work hard american dream pull yourself up from your boot like whatever that narrative is but the uh that is shifting in my opinion towards this more like now that we understand like humans better mm-hmm. that you know yeah you should probably get all the sleep you can get you should eat well you know you should manage how much effort you put into or the amount of over effort you put into something because you, if you're burning the candle at both ends, eventually it's going to completely yeah. disappear. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. But again, like the fact that you did it and a lot of your fan base is younger, that sets a good example. Yeah. In my opinion, like those of you watching that are in school, you have, unless like many of you are probably working whenever you're not in school, but you have built in breaks already. Like you have your yeah. summer break. But anyway, I, I digress. Um, it's still super interesting to talk about, to think about. And I really hope that you don't take eight years to do it again. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've been talking about that. We don't know how long it's going to be till I do it again. It probably won't be eight years. But it's one of the other things we've discussed now that we have a lot of people working for us as Hidden Gnome is how do we get, how do we build this into everybody? everybody who works for us, we want to make sure we can have this on a rotating, because like I said, I can't help everybody do this, but I can definitely help people working with me uh, to do that. So that's what we're working on now. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay. Um, Let's talk about looking forward a little bit. Okay. Uh, You played around with some ideas on on your break. I know you have Mm -hmm. some, like, I'm not asking for what the ideas are, but you previously said that you guesstimated that you'd be starting something new after a couple more cradle books and yeah. we're, we're sort of in the gray area of where that could qualify. Uh, is that, is that still a plan uh, for you before the series ends or are you feeling like plans are changing? Yeah, it, uh, it, it kind of, the question we're sort of asking and the release, the release of this could change. But the questions we're kind of asking are, should I write the rest of Cradle all in a row? So 10, 11, 12. Uh, And then work on something else. 
or should I write 10 and then write something else and then write 11 and then write something else and then write 12 and write something else. And so the release still might be staggered. Like, right. Like I might write 10, 11 and 12 while 10 comes out and then work on something else and then release that. And it, you know, the scheduling might change. I don't So that's, that's kind of the question that's up in the air. Uh, it's probably going to be, I'm probably going to write 10, 11 and 12 or at least 10 and 11 probably, but that's not, I don't, feel anything giving that away because we still haven't really decided we've replanned yeah. a lot so there's a lot of options on the table and the the two things i'm juggling now are a new project and traveler's blade the second traveler's gate trilogy so those yeah so yeah. those are the those are the two things that i'm kind of weighing there's like this weird psychological thing that i've noticed that happens with has happened with a couple people in the fandom mm-hmm. i now say traveler's blade almost all the time like i literally wrote yeah. out in this morning traveler's gate series because i knew if i didn't i would have said traveler's blade series i screwed that up not too long i i did that not too long ago where i was like yeah it's the traveler's blade books wait because there's so many swords in this story it feels like it probably should have been called traveler's blade you know yeah no no it, it, it's it reminds me of i think it's colloquially colloquially called the nelson mandela effect or like the berenstein bears yeah yeah, the mandela effect, yeah. Where, like you, you remember a past thing like a collective group of people remember a past thing differently like in the same i way. would have i would have bet you a thousand dollars that it was berenstein not berenstein yep same and i read would those have. books a lot when i was little i know when i was a kid and so I, I I know that it's for you. Just assume it's going to be Steen because it's a more common name ending, and it's written in cursive. The logo is written in cursive, so it's hard to tell whether it's an E or an A. And I I know that, but it still makes me feel like no, it wasn't Barry. I like I I know it wasn't Barrett Steen. I know that exactly. <laughs> so but it was wrong. What I'm getting at is, I feel like this is a guess, but maybe Traveler's Blade is going to help manifest itself at some point where. It, it might be easier to write or, or what have you, but I'm not going to lie. I am pretty interesting to see what a uh, evolved upgraded will no longer like a, you know, first series author does with uh, either those characters or that world. I'm also interested in that. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, there are a lot of people that talk about the um, amalgam iteration and the magic system in, in the, in the discord and how, some of the larger higher magic systems could come into play uh, yeah. especially with the, you know the backdoor skill set that Valen had yeah. um, so it i mean I, i'm i'm very much not alone when i say i would be looking forward to that but again like when that comes out again i think all of us just want you to be want you to like writing <laughs> yeah, what, yeah yeah in fact we so- want you to love writing <laughs> I appreciate that. Look, and I will just just to say, I still enjoy. I still enjoy the stories. I still enjoy working on the stories. I still enjoy coming up with ideas for stuff. So it's it was the process of writing that was very difficult for these last few books. The actual, I I, I don't hate Linden or anything. I still like Cradle. I I still enjoy all that. So it's not that has not gotten to be a burden or anything. I still enjoy that. But it's the actual process of writing the books that was grating on me. So in terms of uh, new ideas, new series, I really what I, one of the things I was hoping for in this break, and I didn't necessarily expect it, but I was hoping for it, was that I would come out really passionate about a new idea that I was like, I can't wait to write this. And that happens sometimes, and usually I don't write them. So then later I come back to them, and I'm, the passion's faded because I had to keep writing whatever I was working on. Right. So I was hoping to come out of this with like, this is my next big thing. I'm really going to do this. I'm really looking forward to it. I just wanted to feel that energy again. And I didn't. I came up with a lot of little smaller ideas that I can work into something. And I, I just was, I was, I was hoping that I would, I would get that fun feeling of, oh yeah, I can see this. But I didn't. Do you have a, like a, a framework in your mind for what makes an idea like tenable? Like what makes it uh, worth turning into something bigger versus like a, yeah i have a i have a lot of criteria for that Uh, there's there's a few things i know i like in stories and so i have those criteria one thing i like is if you're writing fantasy uh, i want as much magic in it as possible 
So this low fantasy thing, nope, forget it. That's that's uh, that's too much like real life. No, get it out of here. So uh, that's that's so. There's a few things like that that I know I like. Uh, I same, also like it. Honestly. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying same. Like I, I like oh, I yeah. like all the magic. And then I prefer a magic system that you're not born to because that just inevitably creates characters that are just better than other characters and just straight up like, yeah, it's, you can never be as good as me because I was born with magic powers and you weren't. So you have the Wheel of Time thing where if you're not a channeler or you're not Matt, then you don't matter. So it's uh, so it's like, I, which I love Wheel of Time, so obviously it works for some series. I just don't prefer writing that. Right. So there's there's a series of criteria like that that I know I want in a series. But the funny thing is the the things that normally get me inspired and get me thinking, oh, I'm really I could definitely do this, are normally uh, characters and magic system world things. So ordinarily, I start with a broad concept that that appeals to me that I really like, like a magic system world thing. So one that I'm probably never going to get around to is a uh, so I. I didn't think about this from the game, but this is how I think of it now is like a magic subnautica. <laughs> so okay. I thought of this already is like a survival in an ocean environment just because I've always really liked ocean environments, but fueled by magic instead of technology. So when I played subnautica, I was like, that's it. So that's one of the reasons why that connected with me so much, but I've always wanted to do that. It's kind of like, basically I would say the Martian, but with magic instead of science. Okay. So I've always wanted to do that. I think it'd be fun, but that is that's the concept that appeals to me is the martian with magic instead of science so is that that thing so that but that doesn't inherently well that one actually does inherently come with some conflict but it doesn't inherently come with other characters it doesn't come with uh any sort of necessarily a plot except maybe if he's trying to get off the planet so God, that yeah so what would that story be within the unified willverse with iterations and abaddon oversight or brochure oversight probably yeah so i could either do it in a case where it's where you don't know that right like so it's just a normal fantasy novel but technically it does connect or i could do it and i i thought of this was doing it in one of the pioneer worlds where somebody gets sent to the wrong pioneer world and so then they're stuck in this entire universe on their own and they have to learn through their own uh magic system and that's yeah. yeah so i mean that's that's where yeah. my head went was like oh a new yeah. iteration was formed and pulled together by the ghosts or whatever yeah. and uh they hadn't planned on having anyone come oh a valon character accidentally backdoors himself or whatever into this world and then time to survive because yeah <laughs> one little dude may or may not affect the fate but the you know the ghosts are they're just there to hold it together until oh yeah until, until scheduled time and so that was that was what I was that that would be fun. Uh, another thing I, I I like I don't really so I I feel like I would enjoy like a settlement building type thing where you just follow the pioneer world on their development as they're learning the magic system and they're learning they're to set up and they're transitioning their old culture because they did come from somewhere into this this new world that doesn't maybe support that and I th I think that'd be fun. So I think of ideas like that. Uh, this is still in the survival. This is all kind of I'm just thinking of my related ideas. There was another one where. I had like a like a colony ship, like a generational colony ship, but it's but it's magic. So therefore, there are the, all these different races, you know, elves and dwarves and stuff, all in this colony ship. And then, what kind of magical race and culture would they be when they finally landed on their destination thousands of years later? Uh, so yeah, so I think of those. Those are the concepts that intrigue me. And then I later go in and attach a plot to it. So normally it's not, normally it's this big high level concept that intrigues me. And then I go in and then now I have to figure out how to make it a compelling narrative. Love it. Love mm -hmm. it. Okay. Um, I have a bunch more questions that we're starting to push at the edge of time. So um, I, there's a couple things I'm interested in knowing that we're both fan asked and I'm, I'm personally interested. How did you learn or is it just, like a core thing that you're good at writing fight scenes like, do you, hmm. like what that's one thing you said you could do all day yeah and i've tried it and i've done martial arts and it's still hard for me i think maybe not doing martial arts is the way why it makes yeah. it so easy because <laughs> i just i don't care about how realistic it is right. i just wanted to look uh so there's a couple answers to that one of them is i i the reason why i could write fight scenes all day 
is because if I know who the characters are and what they can do and what their conflict with each other is, then writing the actual fight scene is just a, it's just an expression of who they are and what they can do. So that is very easy to write for me because I can just kind of I can just play with it. So there's no wrong answers. So I can just do I could do that. Uh, a book full of fight scenes I'd finish in a week. So do you? Uh, go ahead. Do you start at like the end result and then you you know what they can do, and then you deconstruct it that way, or do you like literally? put your mind in the mind of the MC and like simulate a fight in your head and see. How I do works. both. Okay. I, I simulate the fight in the head for sure. Uh, but what I do first, I didn't really cover this in terms of when I was talking about ideas, but one of the things that I like the most when I'm fleshing out a world is to create the extraordinary individuals in that world, because that's helped. That helps me visualize. First of all, like, they're cool people. And second of all, it helps me kind of get into the heads of who are the best at this. So in the in Elder Empire, I came up with the guild heads first. So that helped me define who these guilds were and what they could do. And then there are cool characters that are out there somewhere running around doing things. So it helps me uh, define what they can do. So what I so I usually do that with combatants is I have a character sheet or I have something so I know what their abilities are. And then any fight scene, of course, is conflict between two characters. So they are trying; they're both trying to accomplish something here. So they're and they're at odds. And I know what that is, so therefore I'm going, and then I know kind of who their personalities are, like, is this guy? <laughs> He's gone. He's back. What, what happened there? Um, the Abaddon tried to cut you off or something. That's but, what it is. But you're back, so you've defied them, and you are now the are Supreme we... Overlord <laughs> once more. All right. Are we, what, what was I saying last? You I don't know where I got off. That, um, you're basically playing chess against yourself when you know everyone's skill set. And um... yeah, yeah. So then I put my head, my then I put myself in the head of I put myself in the head of the characters, and then I also kind of sort of try and watch what it would look like if it was in a movie. So I do both of those things, and that helps me figure out what the what the fight would look like. And then in terms of how to write it, it was very difficult for me at first to figure out how to make sure everybody was picturing everything relative to everything else. That's very difficult. And you either tend to over explain like this guy standing here and this guy standing here, or you tend to be vague and therefore stuff happens in the fight that you weren't prepared for. Cause I was like, wait a second. I thought that guy was standing 10 million feet away and now he's punching the other dude. So what I did was I read fight scenes from people who I thought were extraordinarily good at it. And I think the person who writes the best fight scenes is Matthew Stover. Okay. Uh, he wrote the Legacy of Kane series, I think is the name of that series. Uh, it's a good series. I just don't remember the name. And then he wrote the novelization of Star Wars Episode Three. He wrote Traitor, which is oh, one of the old. Star Wars. I read yeah. Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, it's I good, thought right? It was so much better than the movie. Yes, so much better. It's so much so better. He, he's extraordinary at writing fight scenes. So I really like the way he writes. He writes fights. So he does. He also wrote uh, Shatterpoint, is the Mace Windu Star Wars novel from. Oh, okay. Anyway. So he, he, I, I copied a lot of what he did. Uh, the Dresden Files, Jim Butcher does a great job with that. So I, I went in with these people who I thought were, wrote really tight action focused fight scenes and I just figured out how they did it. And I sort of copied that. Wow, that's like really, really helpful information. Yeah. Cause now that's what I'm gonna do. I just started a similar series to Dresden called the Alex Vera series. I haven't read Dresden, but uh, I that hear starts it. off extremely similar to Dresden. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, okay, uh, one more question, and then we can just you know goof off for a minute or two before we close out. Um, yeah. You wrote Winter Steel different, mm -hmm. and was there a scene that when you wrote it, you were thinking to yourself, "This isn't gonna like the the beta readers aren't gonna be into this." And then when you got to them, you were like, oh, that's a great scene. If you can't remember, that's fine. But like, I'm just interested because you wrote it differently. Normally you write scenes that you think will be good, but this time you wrote every scene that you thought could exist ish, yep. and then pulled it back from there. Hmm. Let me think for a second. So there was the, the scene that leaps into my mind was the fight in the middle where Lyndon's pulling the armor out of his void key and he's mm -hmm. fighting the the, the, the guy missile with, like, with like the super staff yeah 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 i was like this fight scene is so lame uh and it's it's i was like this is so dumb 
This is just, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. And then basically everybody was like, wow, this fight scene's really cool. And so some people were like, this fight scene's cool, but this it doesn't need to be here in the book or it needs to be at a different place or it needs to be whatever. And other people were like, you know, they had their own opinions about it, but they still were like, oh, this, the, so obviously the fight scene's good. And I was like, yes, obviously. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, so, yeah. in hindsight, it showed us, it was like the, in my opinion, I believe that fight scene was the first true showcasing of another person's point of view for Lyndon. Mm -hmm. And then Lyndon like being completely nonchalant without knowing that everybody yeah. else is blown away. Like he, yeah. he was supposed to have shattered his soul for, you know, three minutes of, you know, juggernaut mode. And in the end he's like, Oh, I used 25% of all my Madra. I'm a little bit <laughs> yeah. tired, but I'm always tired. Okay. This, yeah. this was a failed experiment. Meanwhile, dudes up on his like floating castle like at least i can be yeah. crippled knowing i have taken away an enemy yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that was great yeah that was fun okay. yeah i i enjoyed that and then everything else kind of in winter steel sort of landed that, that was uh that was something where oh yeah oh okay there was there was one other thing where i was like i thought we were cutting back to the uncrowned tournament way too much and the people were going to be like well these fights are boring and, and there was some of that i mean i ended up cutting some things and sometimes people were like well Aaron's obviously going to win this particular fight or, or whatever and so it, that that had a lot of different opinions but it was it was better regarded than i realized so even some of the stuff i cut from winter steel which was mostly extra yon show may stuff which is kind of funny but it was people were like oh i liked it but it just doesn't necessarily contribute to the to the plot so yeah that that was one of the weirder character developments i didn't see coming was the um mm -hmm. the sympathetic like humanization of yan cho may based off of yeah. what we had seen in Ghostwater. Uh, that was cool i had originally planned on doing a lot of this in Ghostwater, and so i just went back to my notes and grabbed the stuff because every time i have all these plans so the books would balloon in, in size and would take me way longer to write but i have to always end up cutting them so this time i went back and put them to put them to good use and then they got cut again so okay now the final actual final question okay this is a serious question will all right and i need you to be honest with me okay did you change winter steel to add the kiss on the last page of the book knowing mm -hmm. that i had a bet on the line with blue and that if I failed, I would have to make an embarrassing lost bet video. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a that's a good question. Uh, so initially, the the book ended with Lyndon just rejecting Yaren outright and kissing Mercy. So then I heard about this. I heard about this bet. So I had to go back and not only add the kiss on the last page, but also then rework the entire romance subplot in the middle there. Uh, initially, uh, Ruby just sort of hated Lyndon and, and therefore expressed Yaren's true feelings. And then Mercy came in and comforted him. So that was, that was the original intention of the series, but I had to change that in order to make you pay off your bet. I knew it. And, uh, for those of you that are actually shipping Yaren and Lyndon, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> for those of you that were shipping anyone else, you're sacrificed. I'm sorry. That's too bad. Come at me in the comments. That's right. Well, Will. You're the best for doing this. I hope that everything that you work through during your vacation pays off in talking to you. I've talked to you several times throughout our, you know, knowing each other ship. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I personally think it's, it's helped. So I hope that it has. But thank you so much for uh, joining me on this podcast. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, man. I, uh, I was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, well... Hopefully we can do it again sometime and Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to bloodline. I know everyone else is uh, bloodline comes out April 6th, April 6th Tuesday. It's already hit number one, but let's make it hit number one again. We're, we're aiming for number zero now. All right. We're, uh, Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 I, I was meant to uh, share some information about that actually. So we actually have now it is our, our uh, highest pre-order as you would imagine from the fact that it's, that it hit number one as a pre-order, but it's now it's sold more copies than the Winter Steel pre-order or the Uncrowned pre-order. Wow. Uh, so it's now our, our number one. And the Audible pre-orders apparently 
have doubled what they were previously from Winter Steel. Oh, that's nice. so. Yeah, pre-orders are kind of up through the roof, and I don't mind telling you, I'm I'm kind of nervous about this because I know he's going back to Sacred Valley, and people have very strong opinions about what ought to happen in Sacred Valley. So I hope I hope everybody enjoys it. You know what? I was debating whether or not I was going to do this, but I am going to make a ten things I'm looking forward to in Bloodline. Uh, okay. And if you if you're if you like this interview and you have strong opinions about Bloodline, you should watch my video because there's some things I kind of think you're going to do, Will, and uh, I'm I'm really interested to see if you actually do it. So. We'll have Me to too. I didn't make any bets. I kind of made one bet, but it, it, it was more of a joke. I didn't make any bets this time, so you don't have to change any, you know, plot or romances. Um, Good. So it's not too late. You're I welcome. Mean, I mean, you're welcome before. for that. Yeah. Um, All right. But yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Have, have a great, great day. launch. Yeah. All right. Later. Excited.